All right, a couple of quick housekeeping uh, tips. There will be a study guide, I promise. It is coming. It might not be here this morning. It might be here this afternoon. Well, at the end of services today, there will be a study guide. And really, it's just some kind of common questions that accompany each parable that we want to be thinking about and answering as we go through the parable. So that is coming. I haven't forgotten. Um, bear with me, please. Um, another warning I will say is I have had a... Um, started with an ear infection, and ear congestion has blocked this ear for weeks now. And so those of you on this side, bear with me. I, you know, if, if you say something, I might, I might turn this way. I'm not avoiding you. I just need to hear better. So please bear with me, which is kind of ironic since the parable of the sower talks so much about hearing and the need to hear. Um, and that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be talking about the parable of the sower. I thought Jeremy did a fantastic job last week introducing the topic. We're studying the parables of Jesus this quarter, um, and it was more of a, a high-level introduction. Today, we're actually getting into specific parables, and specifically today, the parable of the sower. Um, and I want to spend this morning, uh, really spend as much time around the parable as we do within it. Um, and hopefully, that'll make a little more sense as we go along if it doesn't. Um, so, just some kind of uh, big picture parable information before we dive specifically into the, into the sower. Parable means, the word parable means to cast along. A uh, story or comparison that is put alongside something else to make the lesson clear. But in this case, we're not talking about ordinary parables. Jesus called them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In the New Testament, a mystery is a spiritual truth understood only by divine revelation. It's it's a sacred secret known only to those kind of on the inside who learn from the Lord and obey him. These parables that we read about from Jesus are an expression in the service of Christ's announcement of the kingdom of God. Because that's really what the parables are. They are announcing the kingdom of God. And Jeremy also mentioned this last week, and so I want us to kind of start thinking about this throughout this quarter. If you read any commentary they will all try and divide up the parables into a lot of different categories. I mean, because there's not a right or wrong, honestly. It's very subjective. But Jeremy and I really like this, this categorization. Um, and so I really want us to be thinking about it today as we go through the sower, but also as we go through the other parables as well. Um, so these kind of three categories. The surprise of God's kingdom. Jesus brought the kingdom in a way that few people expected. God's upside-down kingdom, the kingdom of God, should reshape our ideas on forgiveness, on wealth, social status, uh, and the invitation of God's kingdom. And then God's kingdom requires a decision, depicting characters at key moments of decision or crisis, usually under an authority figure. So keep those in mind. Probably, as long as we have enough time, each, each Sunday we'll try and identify and ask you, what do you think um, the parable that we're talking about, where that fits into? Thank you, sir. Um, so be thinking about those categories as well. And then one more thing before we get started. I really like this uh, quote about the parables and how to approach them. And give me a moment here to kind of read through this. It says, instead of reading a parable and saying, how is this about me and my relationship to God? It's reversing it and saying, how is this about Jesus and his inauguration of God's kingdom? And if I'm a part of God's kingdom too, then this teaches me something about the new world and the new value set of God's kingdom that I'm a part of. And that's how it, 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 uh, and that's how it then starts to speak to me. But it's not about me, it's about Jesus. So think about the parables, how they apply to us, but how they apply to um, Jesus and his coming kingdom. All right, so let's get into the parable of the sower. Or if you're not into brevity, the word of the kingdom to be diversely received according to the moral condition of hearers. Uh, this is actually found in three of, God, three of our Gospels. Matthew 13 is going to be our primary text today. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can be turning to Matthew 13. It's also found in Mark 4. And it's also found in Luke chapter 8. And so, in Matthew chapter 13, we see a recording of the events of what I've heard it referred to as a crisis day in the ministry of Jesus. He knew that the growing opposition 
of the religious leaders would lead to his crucifixion. On this particular day, he delivers multiple parables. There are seven. Um, with the sower, Matthew puts the sower up front. Actually, Matthew puts the sower as potentially one of the first ones that we read about. I'm not going to say it was the first one because we know a parable can be as simple as a statement. Um, so it's very hard to say what was the first parable. But Matthew kind of leads, uh, introduces Jesus' uh, introduction of the parables with the sower. So I really want to, it's really important to get into the context of the parable, what's happening around it, rather than looking at it in isolation. So I want to ask maybe, and for those of you here that were here Wednesday, you heard Scott say we're going to be looking at Matthew 13. You also heard him say uh, extra credit if you read Matthew 11 and 12. Um, so, and that's intentional, right? What events preceded this parable? Again, we want to get an idea. It could be specific. It could be general. What's the mood? What's the setting? What's happening? What's happening in the days leading up to this parable? Thoughts? Any ideas? Nobody did the extra credit? Well, what we see is Jesus healing. We see Jesus teaching. No surprise. And we see the reaction to that. And it's all over the board right? Um, he's making his way through cities, through towns, and we see the response. It's positive, it's neutral, and it's negative. There's a lot of negativity, but the crowds still continue to grow. Um, he's, he's, he's that lightning rod that we knew he would be, quite honestly. And so, as the, in, as the parable, in the parables we see in chapter 13, they're really a commentary on the stories that are told in chapters 11 and 12. Um, some people are accepting with enthusiasm. Others are rejecting him. And some need some more convincing, including John the Baptist. You need a little bit more information. Are you really who you say you are? It's also worth noting, I would say, in Matthew 13, in verse 1, it tells us that it happened on the same day. It starts in verse 1, on the same day. So what that tells me is, preceding events in chapter 12 um, had already occurred. Possibly going back to verse 22-ish, maybe the events of 12-22. Uh, but when we start in chapter 13, that's not the morning, that's not the beginning of the day. Things had already been going on. The mood had already started to be set um, regarding what's, what's happening. All of this factors into the parables that he's going to deliver on this day. But it's important, really, to take a look at the audience, too. What do we know, what do we know about the, the audience, this group that's, that's here listening to these parables? What we do know is, we read in the Luke's account, it says people were coming from town after town. So... The surrounding area where Jesus' ministry had been happening in Galilee, northern Galilee area, people were flocking. They were coming from, it wasn't just a local thing, they were following, they were gathering, coming from town to town. Uh, again, we're coming into kind of the height of Jesus' popularity, notoriety, for better or for worse. He, they knew who he was. Um, he went through cities and villages healing and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Um, so this is a large crowd, and we're going to read that so, la so large that Jesus couldn't stand on the, sh on the shore. He had to withdraw on a boat. I think it's possible also to get an idea of kind of the moral makeup of the crowd, the spiritual composition and condition of the crowd, possibly. Uh, it's like, I don't think Jesus simply got to this spot, looked up at the physical terrain, and decided to tie it into a story. I think he looked at the moral terrain including what he'd just been experiencing the past several days, and even prior to that, and used the physical as the connector to the moral. Remember that in chapter 11, we read that he denounced the cities um, that he did most of his mighty works in for being unrepentant. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Uh, Capernaum. He says, if the mighty works we did in I did in Capernaum would have been done in Sodom, Sodom would still be here. Pretty strong statement. 
Um, we have his opponents accusing him of being demon-possessed. His family thought he was out of his mind. Crowds that followed him one day would abandon him the next. We read in John 6, 66, that many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Even when they asked why he spoke to them in parables, he says, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, quoting Isaiah 6. For the, for the large group here, and I'm not saying everybody, but by and large, this was the, the moral makeup of this crowd, the people that were following. These were the conditions um, as Jesus goes into, into, his, into his parable. All right, so where does this take place? Location is important. Location is key as well. What do we know about the location of, of this day? Sea of Galilee, absolutely. Yep, yep, the northern part. Um, we read in verse 1 that Jesus went out of the house. Um, probably Capernaum, which was the city where he commonly dwelt after his ministry began. Um, edge of the Sea of Galilee. There's actually a location called the cave of the sower that's traditionally held as the location where this might have occurred. Um, and looking at this now, I probably should have done one photo at a time. But what you see is, especially in the big picture here, you can kind of see this cove, this cutout. This is generally thought of as the location. Again, this is kind of the northwest, primarily north, but northwest uh, coast of Sea of Galilee, which is, again, right next to the city of Capernaum. Um, but it's a, it's a natural kind of cove. It almost looks like this, this bottom right, it almost looks like a natural amphitheater. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit too, but you kind of get an idea of the terrain of where Jesus was preaching and teaching. And I find that stuff really interesting. So, um, Jeremy did not know I was going to do this. I didn't mention this to him. Um, but the dashingly rugged gentleman on the left here is Brother Jeremy DeHutt. Um, for this class, we sent him over to the Sea of Galilee to get this footage. Um, and he, he, he's, he, it's, it's a long trip, so, but we really appreciate his dedication. No, um, I didn't even know. He, I, I stumbled across this. He didn't even tell me, like, as we were preparing for this, that he had this. Um, but I want to set it up a little bit. He's going to talk um, about, they're actually going to go to the location of the Cave of the Sower, talk a little bit about the acoustics and kind of understanding how that might have worked. And then at the end of it, he's going to read our first section. I do want to get into the, the parable of the sower. So if you have your Bibles, be ready to follow along. But he's going to pick up in verse 2 um, and read through verse 9. So we'll, leave, we'll use that as kind of our introduction to the parable. Um, so uh, here is... Our own Jeremy DeHutt. We know Jesus did a lot of teaching on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. There's that triangle up here on the north between three cities where he did 80% of his ministry. Now, where would we go from here to see some of those places? Well, we want to go down to the Cove of the Sower. This is where he pushed off into the water just a little ways so he could speak to the people on the hillside. Well, I think this is right. You can correct me. You have never led a tour group down to the Cove of the Sower. No. And why is that? It's almost impossible to get to. <laughs> okay, so it was amazing to go to. It was a lot of work. It was worth the work. But the average person coming to Israel is not going to make that stop. No, from the place that we found a park that we could access it, it was probably 45 minutes hike. Over rocks. It was very difficult to get there. Jeremy, we've come to the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and as you can tell, there's a natural cove here in the shoreline just behind us. In the mid-1980s, there was a drought in this area, and the water level dropped and exposed a number of harbors around the Sea of Galilee. We know from Luke chapter 5 that one of the times Jesus was coming along this side of the sea, there were a lot of people crowding around him trying to hear him. And when he got to some spot around here, he got into a boat with Peter and pushed back from the shore and spoke up to the people that were still on the land. 
Now, standing here in this cove, you can turn around and see it forms kind of a natural amphitheater. And it's really easy to imagine Jesus, this is his stage as he turns and faces the people and speaks up to them. Many people have questioned whether or not Jesus could actually be heard by a large group of people if he's a few feet off the shoreline. Let's do an experiment. Let me go up the hill a little ways. When I get up there, I want you to read the parable of the sower in a natural but loud speaking voice. And let me see if I can hear it. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to read from Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. The instant he started talking, I thought for a second he was still using the intercom. I could hear him perfectly. No doubt, if I was twice as far away, I could have heard him easily. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. The parable of the sower really marked the beginning of Jesus using parables in his ministry. That that one really paved the way. And you finally get to the end of the parable when Jesus has this invitation. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Explaining even to his disciples afterwards, who didn't get the parable, that we need to make sure that we're paying attention and allowing Jesus to teach us what he wants to teach us and that we're going to hear and allow his word to go deep into our lives. All right. That's all the time Jeremy gets. Um, but that was, uh, that really brought it in for me to kind of understand and get a sense of um, what it could have been like. So we just read the parable. We're familiar with the parable. Let me ask you a question. So if you go on to read the other parables in this chapter, You'll see, and some of the others, quite honestly, as well, they begin with, the kingdom of heaven is like. And they proceed to tell a parable. Why do you think the parable of the sower doesn't begin like that? No right or wrong answer. I mean, this is just opinion. But what, what, any thoughts as to why the parable of the sower does not begin with the kingdom of heaven is like? Because what? Okay, because it's not about the kingdom of heaven. About how the individual hearts receive the truth. Yeah, it, it really describes how the kingdom begins, right? It's about the word. Um, and, and again, that's why this is a very foundational parable, I think, and Matthew attempts to convey that. Um, it's about how the kingdom starts. And then we get into the parables comparing it. Um, to uh, comparing things to the kingdom of heaven. So let's continue. Let me finish this up. Jesus actually gives us the explanation, right? So we can read the explanation and we can be done, which is great for the teacher because then, you know, then we have just some, some time to kill. So verse 18, it says, and I didn't make it in my notes, so I'm going to turn and read it. Here then the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So, 
let's break this down a little bit. Um, who's the sower? Let's keep this simple, right? Who's the sower? Okay. We are. Anybody? I would agree with that. Any other? Yeah, I think, I, I, yes, I, I think you're right. In this context, God, God is the sower here. Yes, I would agree with that as well. Um, if the majority of the parable discusses the soil, why does Jesus call it the parable of the sower? And by the way, Matthew's account is the only one where Jesus specifically says, hear the parable of the sower. He calls it the parable of the sower. The other accounts just say there was a sower. But Jesus specifically, Matthew records it, Jesus tells us the parable of the sower. He calls it that, so we're going to go with that. But a lot of the focus is on the soils. Any thoughts on that? What? It's where it begins that with, the, with the, someone spreading the word? Okay. Anything else? It was an easy connection for the, for the people at the time. Someone sowing seed, they would get that right away. Yeah. The other thing that I'm struck with when I read this, um, I can't speak intelligently about the agrarian culture of Jesus' day, but to me, this farmer, this sower, seems a bit radical in his practice, a bit reckless in his practice. Um, I would find it hard to believe that it was commonplace to randomly toss seed. I could be wrong, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that, that conversation. But I've, I've tried this. Um, I have a love-hate love relationship with my yard. Some of you might as well. When it's in the upper 90s for weeks at a time, and I can't keep up with the watering, uh, you know, so I have to get on my weather app, and I have to check every day. And when I see that 30%, I get excited. It's really bad. Um, but th those are the times when I hate my yard. Um, and don't let the name fool you. Kentucky bluegrass this time of year is Kentucky brown grass. But I know in the fall there will be spots that I have to go back and reseed. And I can do a couple different things. I can go to those spots and I can toss a handful of seed that I have. Um, or I can kind of rake back the dead grass. I can till the dirt a little bit. Um, I can put the seed in it specifically, um, put some topsoil on it, give it some water. I've done both, but only one way really worked. And yet that's probably not even an accurate comparison to the story. Closer, a closer one would be if I took my seed and I tossed it in my yard, I tossed it on my sidewalk around my yard, um, Top, tossed it on top of the landscaping where I've mulched and I've, and I've rocked, and then I, I've tossed it into the creek that runs through my backyard. Crazy, right? No one would do that. The only scenario in which I could afford to be kind of just so reckless with my seeding is if I had magic seeds. I was expecting them to do a lot more than, than ever thought possible. And that's what the sower had. And because of the extraordinary potential of the seed, he could be generous with how it was spread, how it was distributed. So I think there's something to being called a parable of the sower because of the nature of the sower. Knowing it's God, the generosity of the sower and, and the, the recklessness almost with which he spreads his word and his love. So what's the seed? I know you hate answering questions that are obvious, but just you know, bear with me. What's the seed? Word. Matthew calls it the word of the kingdom. Mark calls it the word. Luke refers to it as the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 calls it living and powerful, or living and active. All right, so finally, what's the soil? I hear hearts. Anything else? I'm going, and we're just getting into semantics here, by the way, but I like, I like hearers, 
here's, here's why. Because the word here is used 19 times in chapter 13. Um, Mark's account actually starts with Jesus saying, listen, and then ends with, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, but again, we're getting at the same thing, right? It's how it's received. But you have to listen first. Um, okay, so let's get into these soils. That, that path soil, that wayside soil, that, that signified that hard trodden path running through the field. Um, this, this case where the, the heart has been exposed to common, on the common road to every kind of evil influence of the world until it has become hard as pavement. We see the rocky places signified as the part of the field where the soil was shallow on the top. The rocky kind of substratum below, below the surface. He's heard the word, but without anything of substance to build on or cultivate, the heart loses interest as quickly as it came. We were just talking about this on the drive here. We have parts of our yard that the grass dies quick, you know, faster than others. And one time we got underneath and found out why there was a huge rock just below the surface. Grass will grow for a time, but it's not going to sustain. We had to remove the rock. My wife already has plans to do more. We were really just talking about this this morning. There's a lot of rock just under the surface in some parts of our yard. Um, but when I read this, I think about, have you ever started a hobby that you started? You were excited. Either, either you saw something on TV, your friends mentioned something to you, um, and so you got excited. You know, you went out, you read everything you could on it, you bought, um, you know, you bought all the equipment, the materials, whatever it is, you bought the clothes and if it fits right, you bought whatever that tied you to that hobby, you were excited. You got it all ready to go. Um, and then after a few months, you look back and it's all just kind of sitting there in the corner. It's just sitting there waiting for you to act on it with the same zeal that you had one time. It kind of sounds like a diet, right? We do this at the beginning of the new year or getting in shape. Uh, beginning of the new year, you get on board, and then you realize, wait, I have to do this how often? I can't eat what? Those persecutions kind of change your plans a little bit. That's what it sounds like with the, rock, with the rocky, rocky soil here. And then we see the, the third soil, the thorns here. The thorns denoted, not actually probably not a thorn bush, probably, um, growing at the same time, but actually soil with thorn seeds kind of latent into the, into the soil, which in due course sprang up, and as one commentator put it, disputing possession with the grain. It's fighting with the grain to own that, that specific part of the soil. Competing interests. Right? What kind of competing interests do we have in our lives? What fights for our time with God? Everything that's not God, yeah. Entertainment? What's that? Work? Absolutely. Worldly pleasures. Cares of the world. Deceitfulness of riches. Idolatry right? Things that we're putting more faith, more time, more effort in than God. And sooner or later, that balance, what started as us and God, those competing interests start to take over, and soon, as we read here, they choke out what we once had with God. And that's not to say we can't get it back, but it gets harder. It gets harder. And so we have, finally, we have this, this good ground, right? Good ground that meant that portion of the field which was free from all the faults of the other parts, and it was, at once, it, at once, it was soft, it was deep, it was clean. Um, I've read that typical agri agricultural yields range from about five-fold to 15-fold, with 10 being considered a good crop. Jesus here speaks of 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, underscoring the power of the word. Any thoughts on these soils? Any comments, questions? Dan?
sometimes we think too, we overthink it, right? They'll never respond. And that's not on us. Yeah, I agree. We do know that people will deny it. People will ignore it, right? But that's, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't help us determine where we share. Absolutely. Um, I do, so I want to mention, there are, when I was preparing for this, I was looking at several different commentaries, lessons, some other materials. Um, one that I took several thoughts from and I, that I wanted to share came from um, a lecture that was done at Florida College last year. Uh, delivered by Brother Edwin Crozier of the Livingston Congregation in Tampa, Florida, because it was really thought-provoking in, in a few ways. And so I want to definitely give appropriate uh, attribution when I'm referencing some of those thoughts. But one of the ones he does really well is comparing Jesus and the sower to the situation that we see in Isaiah. And we're talking about Jesus and Isaiah on Wednesday nights in here as well. So I thought it fitting. But throughout Isaiah, the language of judgment is the language of farming. It's a vineyard. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus compares the crowd in our parable to Israel in the days of Isaiah. Um, so let me make a couple comparisons here as we take a look at this. Um, just like the sower begins here in chapter 13, talking about the pathway soil, those who would not or choose not to understand, Isaiah begins in chapter 1, saying, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. We move into chapter 5 in Isaiah. Bear with me here a little bit. But you can start thinking, think, as I read this, think in terms of the sower and what we know about the parable of the sower. Chapter 5, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, he cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard that I have not uh, done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed. And briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. You can hear some of the comparisons there to this vineyard. Jesus referenced chapter 6, referencing the, peop the very people he was speaking to in chapter 13 there. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 9, And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And turn and be healed. The resistance of Israel in Isaiah's message anticipates the resistance to the gospel that was going to happen. A little more clarity around this passage. Uh, I'm not going to go there, but in Psalm 115, it talks about idolaters becoming like idols, blind and deaf. We become like the things that we cherish the most. God was not warning about a future judgment, but he was explaining that judgment had already begun. You know, we think of judgment kind of as a singular event because we talk about the day of judgment. And perhaps that actual sorting of who's going where is a singular event. But, but the process of judgment is in progress. And that's what he's telling, that's what God's telling Israel, and Isaiah's telling Israel at this point. But then when we go to chapter 27, we see that same vineyard from chapter 5. The Lord's taking care of this vineyard, and the soils have been transformed. Beginning in verse 2, it says, In that day a pleasant vineyard, sing of it, I, the Lord, am its keeper, Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. It's a different vineyard transformed. 
And then finally, in chapter 55, the key passage connecting the sower to Isaiah, beginning in verse 10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. One of the points that Brother Crozier makes about this would be to suggest that the fourth soil we read about, that good soil, is not a different soil, but maybe it's the first three soils converted and transformed. Think what it takes to have good soil, the work that has to go in to be prepared. You don't usually just stumble upon good soil. There's some work that has to be done. We talked about that thorny soil. How many of you thought of yourselves in that thorny soil? Competing interests in life. Again, perhaps the fourth soil is not a different soil, but the first three soils converted and transformed by the Word of God. God's Word does what it's supposed to do. God's promises are coming true in Jesus no matter what it looks like in the moment. And we're told it can transform thorn and briar into cypress and myrtle. All right, so what do you think? Where does the sawyer, where, sawyer, where does the sower fall in, in this categorization? Any thoughts? What's that? So it's funny you say that because I would say something different. So I, and, and, maybe, and maybe because this is one of the first ones, maybe we could see a little bit of everything in it, quite honestly. But so tell me why you said requires a decision. Because I like that. And again, there's no right or wrong answer here. I saw, some are a little bit clearer than others, I think. Yes? Okay. So this is good because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why I think it's the first one. But I, I like the conversation. So Matthew's account is the only one that specifically has Jesus say the parable of the sower, and he focuses on kind of the radical methods of the farmer. This idea of the, the radical farmer growing a radical crop, and that's how the kingdom of heaven works, right? It works in ways we would never expect. The king employs methods we would never expect. He sows on pathway, on the rocks, among the weeds. If the Pharisees and scribes had heard the explanation of the soils, who do you think they would have had in mind with those, those bad soils? They would have thought of the tax collector, the prostitute, um, the physically handicapped who had potentially already been judged, right? Those are the people they would have thought, the sinners in their eyes. And these are the very people that Jesus eats with, talks with, ends up being, in some cases, the good soil. Uh, Matthew 21, 43, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. I think we've maybe made a case for all three of them. And I like that. Okay, I got two minutes left, and I want to make a final thought here. As we continue forward with these parables, um, one more point that I really like that, again, I'll, this goes back to Brother Crozier here, but he said, we tend to read the parables and think us, them. Even the disciples came and said, why do you speak to them in parables? 
And he answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has been given, it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. The Bible only details Jesus explaining, Jesus explaining the meaning of two parables. This one and the parable of the weeds in the field, which is later in the same chapter. Those are the only explanations we get for those two parables. One time in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable. Peter asks him, who is this parable meant for? And Jesus tells him another parable. However, Mark 4.33 says, With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. So he explained these things to his disciples in private. So here's the question that's posed. If the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why did he provide the parables meant for them and not the explanations meant for us? Again, we read verse 11. It says, To you has been given the kingdom, uh, give, been given to know the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But what we hear is, To us has been given, right? That's why we read it. Us, the disciples, them, the other people, those that hear but don't understand, those that see but don't perceive, us the good soil, them the bad soil. That's how we read this, right? And yet, what does God give us? He gives us the parables meant for them. He doesn't give us the explanation. At the very least, it should cause us to humbly and continually evaluate our connection to the kingdom of heaven. And as Brother Crozer points out, maybe what we're supposed to learn is that we're not as us as we think we are. So, next week, I appreciate, your, I appreciate your time. Next week, the Pharisee and the tax collector is going to be taken from Luke 18. Um, later, we'll make an announcement. I'll have the handouts ready in the foyer uh, by the end of services. Thank you very much.